Today on The Big Story, China reports another death from the Wuhan virus as infections spread for the first time to other Chinese cities. All for one and one for all, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Swee Keat outlines how 4G leadership will lead Singapore into the future. Real life love stories of couples' unwavering commitment while battling breast cancer. It's the start of the new week, a short week. You're watching The Big Story, where we will discuss the hottest topics of the day and explain why they matter. I'm Harianto Diman, coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. We begin with news out of China that another person had died over the weekend from the mysterious Wuhan virus, bringing the death count to three. The number of infections doubled in Wuhan with 136 new cases over the weekend. Previously, there were 62 confirmed cases. And it's now also confirmed the virus has spread outside Wuhan. Two people in Beijing and one in Shenzhen have been confirmed to be infected. Shenzhen, as you may know, is just next to Hong Kong. The spread of this mysterious virus outside of Wuhan is especially worrying because China is in the midst of preparing for the Chinese New Year. Hundreds of millions of people are expected to travel across China, raising the fear about the spread of infections. Now to tell us more, of course, we have a China correspondent, Elizabeth Law, who is live on Skype with us. Hi, Liz. Hi. Uh, Hi Liz, I uh, understand that you are in China right now, right? Yes, I am in Beijing. Mm. And uh, Liz, if you could tell us what's the situation on the ground now. You know, there's fears that the great migration where hundreds of millions of people will be travelling throughout China and this is, you know, going to risk uh, the spread of the infection. Well, you can clearly see that people are a lot more concerned today after it was announced quite early this morning that there has been quite a drastic jump in the numbers. We've seen hundreds more cases in Wuhan alone. And that's mm. quite concerning. Now, how we know that people are more concerned is the fact that the hashtag Wuhan pneumonia has been the top trending topic. And also, um, this there have been 500 million, yes, let me get the number correct, because 500 yeah. million people following the hashtag. So I think that gives you an indication about how concerned people are about it. Right. And of course, uh, this is quite a stark difference from the time we spoke last week. Now, last week, you gave us as a, an update when you went to Wuhan itself that uh, people were quite nonchalant as compared to now. Mm, yes, but then again, to be, to be fair, this was all at the point when uh, there were no deaths, the number was still quite low and people felt that, you know, the, the chances of this spreading between humans uh, is very low. But today, if you look closely at the update from the Wuhan Municipal Health Authority, mm. the, they, don't, they no longer say that there is no hard evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. And I think that is something that is quite a significant development because, and also the WHO says that there is possibility of uh, limited spread between humans in close proximity. So I think this suggests that there is a possible p possibility that it could spread between people. And so I think people are getting a bit more concerned. You can see a lot of chatter on Weibo on social yeah. media as well. And yeah. also the various health authorities from the different places, be it Beijing, be it Wuhan, of course, um, mm -hmm. Guangdong, where Shenzhen is, uh, all of them have been issuing these various steps and guidelines on what to do, how to prevent the disease and yeah. basically steps on how to try and watch out whether or not you have this or even if you don't have the disease or you don't have signs of it, at least how to basically yeah. practice safe, good hygiene, clean hygiene and most importantly, how to wash your hands. Right. You're know, talking about uh, health advisories that have been issued by the authorities. Now, the authorities in Hong Kong, United States, Thailand and even here in Singapore have been screening visitors from Wuhan and uh, we understand that you are coming back uh, to Singapore as well tomorrow. Are there any prior declarations of sorts that you needed to do uh, before you made your way back here to Singapore? And, you know, for travellers as well who are coming uh, from China itself, coming into Singapore, is, are there going to be any um, extra steps perhaps that, that, that need to be taken before they can uh, be clear to come into Singapore? 
Well, you have, as you mentioned, uh, all flights coming in from from Wuhan and uh, mm. have been subject to temperature screenings. Uh, that's at Changi Airport. Uh, several other airports are screening visitors from China. Mm. Uh, it's just a blanket screen of all visitors from China because they, they are not leaving anything to chances. Now, uh, mm. we haven't seen any updates from the WHO. We are just taking it at that. Uh, I checked I checked MOH's website uh, right before we came on the show. Uh, so far, they haven't said that I have to do anything. Uh, right. But maybe after you asking me this question here, I might get pulled <laughs> out at Changi Airport tomorrow. Who knows? Mm. We'll, I'll keep you guys mm. updated. Yes, yes, please, please. But of course, again, uh, like we always tell you, you know, be it whether when you were reporting to us uh, with regard to the protests in Hong Kong and now in China, please, please keep safe. And certainly, we are looking forward to your return, to your safe return here in Singapore tomorrow. Now, of course, uh, to stay up to date with the latest on the Wuhan virus, you can visit our website at straightstimes.com. Now, moving on, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Swee Keat today painted a vision of how he and the 4G leaders intend to lead Singapore. Mr Heng spoke on his team's unwavering commitment to build a future where all Singaporeans have the opportunities to succeed, where no one will be left behind if they give their best and where everyone will pull together as one. In his keynote speech at the Institute of Policy Studies annual Singapore Perspectives Conference, Mr Heng said, My 4G colleagues and I are committed to go beyond just working for you, to working with you, to build our future Singapore. Mr Heng added that just like how our founding fathers built up nationhood with policies such as home ownership, the Singapore Together movement launched last year will be the 4G leader's way of nation building. Now we have assistant political editor Lim Yan Liang in the studio to tell us more. Welcome, Yan Liang. Hi, Arento. Now, Yan Liang, first of all, you know, if you could tell us what stood out the most for you in uh, DPM's speech, the main takeaway of his speech. My main takeaway today was that Deputy Prime Minister Heng Swee Keat, uh, in essence, gave what looked to me like the mm. broad strokes of the PAP's uh, general election manifesto right. for the coming general election. La. Yeah, by framing the long-term issues facing Singapore as well as the 4G leadership's proposal to tackle them. Right. So DPM Heng said uh, we're living in an era of rising inequality and the government will ensure no Singaporean is shut out of opportunities mm. because of their family background by doing more to help disadvantaged children, for instance. Mm. He also said that at a time of technological disruption, uh, the government will do more to help workers upskill and in particular he highlighted workers in their 40s and 50s Right. And Mr. Heng also pledged to keep public housing affordable in a time of uh, widening generational divides. Mm. Mm. Right now, Yan Liang, it seems that the running theme as well in uh, Mr. Heng's speech is about uh, rallying Singaporeans to work together, right, with the leaders to build the future of Singapore. And he cited the Singapore Together movement as well. And he gave examples of it. Could you share more on that? Yes. So the Singapore Together movement is the latest citizen and state engagement effort mm. launched by the government last June. So what I found notable was that Mr. Hing compared the Singapore Together, which is in the same vein as our Singapore conversation, yeah. with the home ownership policy of the founding generation of PAP leaders. So by calling the citizen engagement movement a cornerstone of nation building, he has, uh, he, he says that this will strengthen Singaporeans' stake in the country and the shared ownership of Singapore's future, right. uh, which is uh, quite notable because, of course, the housing policy mm. is considered one of the uh, bedrocks of Singapore's stability. Yeah. Mr. Heng also went as far as to call Singapore together the way forward for uh, the country, mm. uh, akin to a pathfinder yeah. or you know, a true north for the country, and that government agencies will craft policies in a more collaborative uh, manner mm. and with government working more closely with the average citizen in more aspects of policy making. Right, right. Some of the areas uh, Singaporeans can look forward to playing a bigger role in include uh, environmental sustainability mm. as well as the look of uh, Singapore's landscape and built environment, right. uh, including the upcoming Somerset Belt and the Geelong Sarai Cultural Precinct. Right. Now, that the side, of course, uh, you know, rallying Singaporeans together. Part of his speech as well, he gave a glimpse of what the next month's Singapore budget is going to look like. What did he say and why say it today, you know? Yeah, as we all know and as was uh, mentioned a few times uh, at today's uh, dialogue, 
uh, to this conference, yeah. uh, the general election is looming, and uh, it's uh, like it or not, it's an election budget. So. Uh, some of the things he hinted at was what he uh, had identified when he mentioned the problems facing Singapore. For instance, he said the government will make a further push to help workers pick up new skills, and he said that the government is developing the next stage of skills future. Right. He also said the government is studying ways to better help lower and lower middle class Singaporeans, mm. including helping current and future seniors to meet their retirement needs. So I take this as a strong hint of uh, possible transfer payments or some other form of subsidies to right. help Singaporeans cushion the rising cost of living, especially in their silver years. Mm. Now, of course, uh, it remains to be seen exactly what the details are. He did mention that uh, the full details he's going to be sharing more when uh, budget comes next month, right? Yeah, uh, February 18. February 18. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, Yan Liang, for you know coming to the show to tell us more. Now, to read more on this, you can check it out on our website, straightstimes.com. And now let's move on to What's Trending, where Dylan will share with us what's buzzing in the internet verse. Over to you, Dylan. Thanks, Arento. It's time for What's Trending. First up, farewell royal life. Prince Harry and Meghan have officially quit royal duties. They will not use their HRH titles any longer. No more his or her royal highness. They'll be known instead as Harry, Duke of Sussex and Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. They will also no longer receive public funds. A Buckingham Palace statement also expressed their wish to repay sovereign grant expenditure for the refurbishment of Frogmore Cottage. The new arrangement will take effect from spring later this year. And moving on, setting a bad example for the young, a mystery box website offering electronic gadgets, fashion wear and beauty products as prizes has been blocked here after our Boys to Men actor Ridwan Asman promoted it on YouTube. The actor promoted the site to his some 500,000 subscriber fan base in a sponsored 13-minute YouTube video in December. In the video, he claimed to have won an iPhone 11 by opening a box for $6.50. The video has since been taken down. How does it work? Well, users are promised a chance to win gadgets by opening virtual boxes at prices ranging from less than one US dollar to about 140 US dollars. Responding to queries from the new paper, a police spokesperson said the authorities had assessed Drink Mall to be a remote gambling service. And finally, in news that might make you go, what? A disgruntled passenger took to Facebook to express his encounter with a driver who accused him and his wife of getting intimate. What did they do? Well, his wife leaned on his shoulder. According to him, they were on their way to an appointment when his wife started to feel unwell and went on to hug his arm and lean on his shoulder. Warning the couple to behave, the driver allegedly told them that this was against the law. She then drove them to a nearby police station where she was told that they had done nothing wrong. Grab has said that investigations are ongoing. Better think twice the next time you lean on your partner's shoulder. Or not. I'm Dylan Ang and that's all we have for What's Trending Today. If you've seen a story you want to share, tell us on Straits Times' Facebook page. Well, thanks Dylan. I really think it's a what moment. But in any case, our third segment is a real... It's a real tearjerker, really. It's a real-life fairy tale love story that has melted many netizens' hearts. Barely three months after Mr. Ian Ng and Miss Chan Siting met on a dating app, she discovered a lump in her breast. Miss Chan was only 26 years old when she was diagnosed with stage 3 triple negative breast cancer, an uncommon and aggressive variety. She gave Mr. Ng the option to walk away, but he decided that was not an option. While breast cancer is still seen as an older women's disease, about one-fifth of women diagnosed between 2011 and 2015 were under 45. Apart from undergoing a series of treatments for the disease, breast cancer patients have to contend with issues of femininity and fertility due to the effects of the treatments. We have correspondent Clara Locke who met the couple and three other breast cancer patients to tell us more. Welcome, Clara. Now, Clara, you met the couple, uh, Miss uh, Ian and uh, Miss Chan. How were they like? So for patients going through cancer treatment, you know, the support they get from their family and their friends and their network is so important. And Si Ting and Ian really embody that. You know, she gave him the option to walk away and instead he told her, in this life you may fight more battles than most people, but from now on, let's make them our battles to fight together. Right. And you know, in life, in real life, they are such a sweet couple, they're very loving, they're very affectionate towards each other. Mm. And Si Ting said that, 
through Ian's actions, she can see that he's really proud to be with her and this does wonders for her self-confidence in a time where she may not feel the most beautiful or attractive. Right. And Clara, of course, uh, the couple, they've just been dating for a few months as well mm. and now they have plans, they've already uh, had a, a plot for a BTO together, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, maybe more on that as well? So I think because they've gone through so much together, these trials and tribulations, both of them agree that they've gone through and had to talk about things that many young couples don't have to deal with until much later in their relationship. Yeah. So I think this has really strengthened their commitment to one another and, you know, their love has really been forged through fire. Yeah. Now, Clara, let's focus on the other three breast cancer patients as well that you spoke to when they shared with you the challenges uh, they face. Could you share more on that? So the two main challenges they face mm. are to deal with fertility and femininity. Mm. So for some women going through breast cancer treatment, um, the treatment drugs may bring about early onset menopause, which means they won't get their period and they can't conceive for the duration they're having treatment. So one of the women, Miss Tracy, who was just 29 when she was diagnosed, mm. and this was less than a year after her wedding. Mm. And right now she's about halfway through a five-year course of hormonal therapy. She'll be about 34, 35 when she's done and right. only then will she know if there has been any long-term effects of the drugs on her fertility. So, you know, the reality for many women mm. who go through breast cancer treatment is that they may never have biological kids of their own and okay. will have to think about possibly adoption instead. Right. And then you also talk about contending with uh, issues of femininity as well uh, because of physical appearance mm. and all that. More on that, uh, Clara. Mm. So, when women go through breast cancer treatment or any form of cancer treatment, you know, one of the most well-known side effects is losing their hair. And then for breast cancer, they may also go through a partial or a bilateral mastectomy. So they lose one or both of their breasts. And right. all these things can have such a big impact on a woman's sense of identity because of the way she sees herself, how yeah. she feels attractive. Yeah. And all this comes at a time when they're in the prime of their life, thinking about things like dating or mm. marriage or starting a family. Mm. And of course, uh, this is really a challenge because, you know, apart from just undergoing and uh, the treatments and all that, which in itself also can be really quite uh, wearing down on, on the body itself physically, there's also these other issues as well, right? Now, that said, uh, Clara, if you could share with us, of course, you know, what are some of uh, the checks that one can do, you know, in terms of uh, checking for any signs of breast cancer. Mm. So the Health Promotion Board recommends mammograms for women above 50 and to go for them once every two years. But all women can perform breast self-examinations once a month and mm. the Breast Cancer Foundation recommends this for women 20 years and older. Yeah. So breast self-exams are meant to familiarise you with how your breast usually feels so that you will be able to detect any abnormalities or any changes. Mm. So you're meant to feel and look for lumps or changes while looking in the mirror, lying down, or while you're in the shower and right. the Breast Cancer Foundation has a step-by-step -step guide on their website. But the thing is, many young women don't know this. Mm. I didn't mm. know this until I started working on this story yeah. and all the breast cancer survivors that I spoke to, you know, they said none of their peers had gone through anything similar and so right. after going through this whole cancer journey and their experience, mm. they really want to do more and speak up for breast cancer self-examinations yep. and create awareness because when it comes to recovery and treatment, yeah. early detection can be so important. Yeah, I mean, I mean of course, and we spoke about this as well earlier on, we were discussing that, you know, this kind of topic, it, it can be quite a taboo topic, right? Mm -hmm. Because it involves uh, very private kind of uh, matters, right, with regard to the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, of course, you know, thank you so much, uh, Clara, for coming on to the show to share more on this. Again, like what Clara mentioned, you know, you can check out uh, the Breast Cancer Foundation website as well on the step-by-step -step, uh, check uh, to see for any signs of lumps or uh, to see any signs of lump. Now, for more on the story as well, you can check it out on our Straits Times website. There we have it, our top stories for today. For more news and videos, do log on to straitstimes.com. Once again, I'm Harianto. See you tomorrow for more stories on A Big Story.